Hi, welcome to our circulation live event at the American College of Cardiology meeting. This is our interview with the editors. I'm Amit Kara. I'm one of the uh, associate editors for circulation uh, and our digital strategies editor. I am fortunate to be joined with Joseph Hill, who is our editor-in-chief of circulation, and Victoria Delgado from University of uh, Netherlands in Leiden, who is also one of our associate editors. And we're going to talk a little bit about circulation, some of the new things that are happening. What we did this week was we uh, we drew in some questions on Twitter and on Facebook, and people have fed some questions that they had burning uh, uh, questions to learn about from our editors. So hopefully we'll get a behind the scenes look at circulation and, and, and learn more about the inner workings. So Joe, I'm gonna start with you. It's, uh, we're almost up to a year now at circulation with the changing of the guard, if you will. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the new innovations, things that you're most proud of that have been most successful in this last year? Uh, well, thank you, Ahmed. This is uh, the first ACC meeting where we are directing all of the activities of circulation, so this is a special moment for us. As you say, we've been handling papers now uh, behind the scenes for over a year, but at full speed now for almost a year. And um, we have implemented a number of uh, innovative things, um, many of which you're spearheading around electronic media and digital strategies. Uh, we have an absolutely wonderful podcast. I just ran into Carolyn. She's uh, interviewing uh, Gabriel Steg right at this very moment. Um, we have a number of opinion pieces on my mind and perspective that have been very popular where people have thrown out ideas uh, that have been in the back of their minds that they've just wanted to get out. Just a couple of weeks ago, Marv Constam and, and Frank Abood talked about how much they were, wished the word ejection fraction would go away. And that one generated a great deal a great deal of interest. It's quite scholarly and, and it's certainly worth reading. We publish, as before, five or six original articles, one of which typically is a basic paper. Um, but we have reworked in our minds, emphasizing that all of those papers, whether they're basic or clinical, translational, uh, population, uh, implementation science, across that full spectrum, that they all speak at some level to the human condition. We really want to make sure that circulation is the journal that speaks to cardiovascular biology, medicine, and practitioners across the spectrum. And as illustrated by Victoria here, one of our strategies is a uniquely international one. As I've said uh, on a number of occasions, about a third of our associate editors are in Dallas, where you and I both live, a third are in the U.S., outside of Dallas, and another third are outside the U.S. in 14 different countries. And each of those editors has the very same role. Victoria has the same role as an editor in Singapore or whose office is three, is three steps down from mine in Dallas. And um, that has, has been particularly exciting, I think. We're capturing the energy from Europe and from Asia and from South America and the expertise and also charging these editors with helping us make sure that we meet the needs of the practitioners and investigators in Europe in the Netherlands, in, in China, and in Singapore, and so forth. And so it's a bi-directional thing. Um, and I'm, I'm so fortunate and blessed to be working with a truly amazing team. At this point, all our editors, of which we have about 50, are calibrated quite closely together. I, I know exactly how these folks think. And when we first started, you know, some of the editors that we recruited were, I didn't know quite so well. And, um, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure to watch these folks being uh, energized and leveraged to do uh, a, what I believe is a fabulous job in circulation. Excellent. Let me, let me highlight a few things I heard you say. Obviously, the, the science component, some of the traditional components of circulation have been retained because they're incredibly important for the field. Some of the innovation is uh, some of the thought pieces and the liberty to uh, express thought in new ways and new formats. Um, you've expanded and really had a highlight of the international focus of circulations. You've said no, numerous times, heart disease has no borders. And so I'm gonna turn to Victoria, one of our editors, and I will say, Joe always says, they're not international editors, they're editors, there's no distinction. But someone who, who does not live in the United States, shall we say, uh, tell us what you think the importance of is having editors that live all over the world. And in and, and your interactions in our meetings, uh, does it feel different? Do you feel like we're one team? Your sort of thoughts is international. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, indeed, I'm really honored for, to form part of uh, the editors of uh, Circulation. And uh, I have to say that I feel really like in a family. 
and when I have uh, the experts to discuss the articles that uh, practitioners, that the researchers should meet to uh, circulation uh, with the most appropriate people that are for that specific uh, uh, topic or for that specific uh, subject. And no matter where the other edi associate editors are, it doesn't matter, they, I will get the best uh, opinion or the best uh, help for that uh, researcher, for that author to help uh, to publish the article, to give good advices, and to make uh, the article better, if possible, because uh, that will um, improve the quality, eventually, of the healthcare of the patients, uh, of those physicians that will read those articles. Yeah, so, so, so you know, as you pointed out, you know, multiple things that, that the collaborative environment of the editors, which I certainly feel, and then we all have the shared goal, which is putting out the best science, and so often we're helping the, the, the authors in, in improving their papers to, to get the best research, regardless of where it's from around the world. So now we're going to jump into some of these behind-the-scenes questions. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people want to know about the inner workings of circulation. Tell us a little bit about how a paper goes through the system and what these meetings are about, this nebulous editor's meeting, and then we'll hear from Victoria as well. Well, that's a good question. It's, uh, you know, it's certainly not uh, apparent. So, so first of all, our model, as we've said, is, is uniquely global and hence electronic. Um, we interact weekly in a video conference face-to-face uh, -face, you know, around the world, but face-to-face -face at some level. Um, but prior to that, with rare exception, we have a conversation online about a paper. We have the editors are divided into affinity groups. There's an imaging group or a heart failure group or an EP group, an interventional group, a basic group. We have, we have affinity groups of usually four, five, or six editors, most of whom are thought leaders in that domain. And if a paper comes in, if a paper comes to Victoria and she thinks, you know, I'm, I'm not sure this is right for us, but I will just use the consult function on our website to reach out to other editors in her affinity group and say, what do you think? Can you take a look? Do you think this is right for us, or should we should we send it right back? And that way, even before it goes out to our reviewers, some pretty accomplished and seasoned reviewers, our editors, are looking at it among themselves and having a candid conversation electronically. Um, that way, we are respectful of our authors. We don't send everything out for review because we get a hundred papers a week and publish six of them. So we don't need to review all of them to do yeah. that. We're respectful of our reviewers as well. Um, so when a paper comes in, we have a tier of, of senior editors. The papers, we, we touch those papers first and we will reject without review something like 20 or 30 percent of them. Then we'll send them to the associate editors and they will dig into it a little deeper and reject without review another 20 or 30 percent, making it about 50. And then they'll send them out um, for external review, a couple of reviewers, sometimes three. And what, what I've asked them to do, and they're all doing, is to be an editor and to read the paper, dig into it, and make a decision. And then when the reviewers come back a week, we hope, later, that then your opinion, which you've already formulated, will either be confirmed or nuanced or changed. And, but you've made a decision, and you've asked other people to help advise you on your decision. And if the decision is to move it forward, then it'll come back up into our meeting, our weekly meeting, and we as a group will discuss it. And so it, it goes, you know, it starts, it go, has a pathway down and a pathway back up. And, and we're doing a pretty good job of moving these things along fa fairly rapidly. You know, sometimes um, there'll be a paper that we really can't decide about and we'll decide to, to sort of chew on it for another week. Sometimes the reviews come in a little late. Yeah. But that's generally ha how it works. And, and you know, I, I'll say one thing I think people would be really glad to hear. It's not just one arbitrary person making thumbs up, thumbs down. There's, there's affinity groups. As you know, we all consult each other electronically. There's a lot of thought that goes in uh, before the, the, the reviews come back. And then, um, importantly, a lot of efficiency, too, to try to make this all happen faster, yet fair. So I think that's really important. Uh, you but, know, but one thing to add to that, uh, one point of confusion that I hear from authors all the time is they will, they will see the two reviewer comments and and suggest that they can address that but what they don't see is what we're talking about behind the scenes they don't see the rather detailed and granular conversation that the editors have had and and you know that's sort of how it has to be but I've had to explain that a number of times that with all due respect I, I you know we took what the reviewers had to say and that was advisory to us we made a decision as an editorial team 
uh, above and beyond that. Yeah, and, and Victoria, tell us a little bit about maybe nuts and bolts of how your week works, what, what sort of things you're doing with circulation day to day or on a weekly basis, uh, some of your activities as an editor. So uh, actually, I like very much the job because uh, I like to receive the articles um, in order to see whether it goes further for revision or not. Um, I have more or less, or I know people that can uh, give uh, good advices, uh, good make good reviews for uh, that article. And uh, once I've uh, suggested those reviewers and it goes back to the reviewers, it comes back to uh, me after two weeks, more or less three weeks. And then we have uh, the meeting where we discuss um, the decision. And uh, actually, it's uh, quite nice because we have all the articles from all the different super specialities or affinity groups. And uh, it works usually that uh, uh, we can have the consultation with among the, the editors for each affinity group, sometimes from other affinity groups because the article has some flavor from other affinity groups. And it works very well because you can post uh, your comments, uh, your um, opinions, and uh, later on discuss again. And when there is already a consultation, that makes uh, the process later on of the meeting much faster and the decision reaching my, much faster. And one uh, thing that I think is also important for the authors is to know as well as uh, Joe said, the opinion of uh, the editors and it's important that in the letter it reach out what we think, what uh, we have thought, what we have discussed in the meeting so that it's clear for the authors also how they have to address the uh, article, how they have to address the revision or change uh, the article accordingly, yeah. which makes much easier. And another uh, important thing uh, I think that, for example, is uh, uh, very facilitating for the uh, authors is that sometimes they can reach the editor Directly, yeah. and discuss specific questions that may be or not clear or difficult, and that also makes more proximal the uh, communication with the editor, more human in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, that, that's been, as an editor myself, that's been the most fun part when you're directly communicating with authors to help make papers better rather than this nebulous submit and hear from this, uh, you know, uh, impersonal email. W one thing I'll say just, to, you know, back behind the, the, the curtain again is w all the activities you mentioned, we have this wonderful online system and there's an inbox where you have new papers as an editor, you have ones that have come back from review, ones that are waiting that have been to the meeting and now you have to sort of bring together the decision letter. We have another one with a concept consultation function where people were consulting. So we are actively checking this multiple times a day. It's a, it's a pretty big role, but a, an important one, and we're certainly glad to do it. Uh, Joe, I want to go back to you and ask you, you know, we've had several, uh, we're really excited about fellows and training and getting them more involved. They're certain the future of science and future uh, leaders in cardiovascular medicine. A lot of fellows have been asking about how can they get involved with circulation? What are things they can do to sort of be part of the, the, the circulation conversation? You know, I. Uh, the, I used to be a fellowship program director. You are a fellowship program director. It's, that's something that is, shall forever be near and dear to my heart. And um, we are uh, highly committed to engaging fellows at many different levels. We have frankly not chosen to have a little fellows corner. Um, we, on the other hand, have opportunities for fellows to submit uh, a number of types of content. I can count quite a few examples of perspectives that have been submitted by fellows. We usually ask them to team up with a, um, an established uh, thought leader in, in, on faculty, um, but we get those all the time, and that's just great. Um, we invite fellows to participate in our weekly face-to-face -face meeting uh, in, in Dallas. Now, that is a, a confidential conversation where we're dealing with people's work, their livelihood, and, and important topics. We take that extremely seriously. We invite fellows to come in and witness the process, again, in, in a confidential way. We also have other, other things. We have uh, our doodle, which is very near and dear to my heart, and um, I'm, uh, I'm, we're hoping with an enhanced social media strategy that we will uh, be able to increase the number of uh, uh, incoming ideas around that, that. We have something called Hospitals of History, which was an idea that emerged at ESC in Rome last year at, uh, in dinner overnight with Antoni Baez de Luna. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the notion that there's a half a page of blank space in the print journal, recognizing that most people don't read the print journal like me, but, but now we put pictures of beautiful hospitals from around the world. And um, 
we just got one from Pitié Salpêtrière in Paris a week ago, and um, we'd love to see more of those. And so I'm happy to tell you that we have two of our proudest fellows in our division, mm -hmm. Janie Savla and Rohan Kara, who are taking this on, including what we are doing at this very moment was, was their idea, and taking under your leadership our social media things to new levels. So there are many ways in which the fellows can get involved, uh, and and we're always looking for more. We're looking for more of those. Yeah, let, let me highlight that. I mean, we're, we, we certainly, both of us as, as fellowship directors, former fellowship directors, value so much the, the trainees, and, and we have a lot of great ideas, many submission types, EKGs, and hospitals of history, and doodles, and we have many more innovative things that are coming that we've thought about, and we certainly look forward to ideas from fellows around the country, ways they'd like to engage. Right now, don't forget our podcast, which uh, hopefully people are listening to every week and hearing all the great science we know Especially younger people may digest uh, the, the articles in different ways, and it's a great digestible way to learn about the uh, latest science and a deep dive with one author. And, uh, and hopefully they're following us on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and sharing some comments, and we can engage some interaction there as well. Um, I'll ask just another couple of questions. One maybe coming back a bit to uh, people have asked a little bit about, you know, what do you look for in a research article? What's What's a good article in your mind for publication? Maybe we hear from both of you of what, you know, what qualifies for a good article? What are some of the parameters that is something that is appropriate for circulation or, or good science in general? So yesterday in my hotel room, I listened to a podcast. I get to, li I get to listen to them in advance. And Graham Hankey uh, answered that question yeah. and in a podcast that's coming out in about three weeks. And I thought he did an absolutely brilliant job. He's one of our associate editors based in, in Australia. A study has to be valid. It has to be true. It has to be internally valid in, in, in the own, within itself. It has to be externally valid relative to the literature. It has to be rigorously done. It has to be carefully and clearly presented. It has to be novel. And interestingly, I, this is one of the things I'm learning a lot in this job. One of the things I've learned that in basic science where my work is, it's pretty easy to tell if something's novel or not. This molecule is novel or is not, and you know, this <laughs> pathway. Whereas in clinical science, it's a little bit more nebulous, and um, everything in clinical science builds on a pre, you know, a platform of other literature. And it's very interesting to me that when we talk about some of these clinical papers, this side of the room says it's incremental, and this side of the room says it's impactful mm -hmm. because it's a subjective decision. Impact is one of our major, major criteria. Not impact factor, as I keep saying. Not impact factor. We will never, ever play to the impact factor. We play to impact. Does this change the way you think about your, the, your, the way you care for patients, the way you practice medicine, the way you do your science? So the definition of what is impactful versus what is incremental is a human decision, Very, and interestingly so. And the, again, that's one of the things I really marveled at, at how we will sit around this room and have a very candid conversation. And some people say, you know what, I think that's incremental and others, others think otherwise. And, and Victoria, your, your specialty, I know there are many things you do well, but imaging is one of your core areas. You know, when you get a new imaging article, it comes in your inbox and you obviously consult a little bit. How, how do you decide if that's impactful, novel, a, a good article in the imaging space in your subspecialty area? That's a very important question because actually, uh, from imaging point of view, uh, we have uh, usually novel imaging techniques, mm -hmm. and therefore novel imaging techniques uh, will at attract attention. It should be anyway valid and reproducible, and also valid externally, as uh, Joe said. But sometimes it's more difficult to have, for example, randomized trials using imaging. Yeah. And. Uh, we don't have that, those, many, those many articles maybe with imaging, but then uh, if there are large series of patients uh, where uh, imaging may uh, define or may change your clinical practice, that can be a good article. I'm going to maybe finish with one final question. I'll go back to Joe, and you talked in the beginning about what your vision was and what we've done so far. Tell us a little bit about where is circulation going? What are some of your goals uh, now that you have a good, almost a year under your belt? Well, I, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm very proud of, the, of what this team has done. It's, uh, we're, we're not there yet, but we've, we've said what we were, we've done what we said we were going to do. Um, I think the journal has, first of all, we are, let me emphasize, we are building on a platform where I'm, I feel like I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. Joe Lascalzo and the people who preceded him set a standard that is 
awe-inspiring, frankly. And so we are blessed to be able to stand on that and take in new directions, which we're doing. We're re-engineering around the importance of the clinical message. We, we try to think in every paper, does that, would a clinician reading that title, would that, first of all, be legible to him or her? Would it speak to him or her? Is it full of verbiage and, and jargon and abbreviations and acronyms? And we, we try to make it so that the whole journal speaks to what is common among us, and that is the care of patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, the, the, the international focus uh, and platform of, of, of leadership is, is running very, very well. Um, I, I will tell you that um, I had a conversation with the basic AEs the other day. The quality of the basic science papers we're getting has unequivocally improved mm. in 18 months, unequivocally so. We had a very large number of them that we moved along in a positive way on Thursday morning. And um, I do basic science. This will never become a basic science journal. So we, we have to rethink. I think, I think what we've done in the last 18 months has been good, but looking to the next 12 to 18, we may, have, we may be in a position, an enviable position of, of upping our bar a little bit there. Um, just before I came up here, I sat down with Eugene Braunwell for half an hour. And as he has done in the past, he's, he's given me uh, lots of good ideas. And, um, uh, that, and I say that to emphasize the fact that we, we've, this team that we have in place has, has innovated and we will continue to do so. There, there's going to be no shortage and no, you know, no sunsetting of innovation going, going forward. Great. Well, we've certainly been a successful last year almost, I think. Uh, thanks for a wonderful team and a great leadership and look forward to many of these innovations that you mentioned. Um, we hope to do many more of these, uh, uh, these live recorded events at, at live meetings and you look forward to this on our social media platform shortly. And we hope that if you enjoyed this on our social media platforms, you like or share or put a comment out there and let us know more about uh, what you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.